Number five, SCP-1128. Number five on our list, 1128, is a terrifying entity that manifests itself as a colossal aquatic predator. It's sometimes described as a being similar to a shark, only in a more grotesque and twisted appearance, with common descriptions across all sightings being a mouth full of teeth. The entity manifests itself as an aquatic predator to anyone who is given a full description of the beast's appearance, either through a written description or a spoken description, so... Sorry. Sorry for describing it. Few surviving subjects have described it as resembling a massive monstrous deformed shark. Once a subject is exposed to detailed knowledge of 1128, they become infected by its latent psychic ability, forming a connection. From here, no immediate abnormal changes in behavior or occurrences are present, with the only notable variance being a hesitation to enter bodies of water. For good reason, too. Once an exposed subject submerges themselves completely in water, they are caught by 1128. Any submerged water is enough. Subjects are taken mysteriously to an ocean, the location of which is redacted by the Foundation. From here, you are hunted by SCP-1128. The Foundation patrols this unmarked ocean in a desperate attempt to contain the creature and protect anyone unfortunate enough to be caught in its trap. It's difficult to interview subjects after an exposure, as any detailed description of the encounter does run the risk of contaminating more Foundation members. Should a member or subject become infected by SCP-1128, treatment is immediately advised, with Class C amnesiacs being used to try and block memory of the entity. So, maybe for your sake and my sake, try to forget number five entirely for your own safety. Now the foundation does advise that if you've been enjoying the content that we produce, you should toss a subscribe our way. Number four, SCP-1451. SCP-1451 is an odd one even by foundation standards. SCP-1451 presents itself as a set of 26 metal statues at the bottom of the ocean. All appear to be statues of children of varying heights. The statues are all standing in a circle, holding each other's hands and facing outwards in a ring formation. Should any object, living or otherwise, with a mass greater than 40 gram enter into the ring, SCP-1451 begins to animate. The statues will shift themselves in a counterclockwise movement. Their hands will raise and lower slightly, and bubbles can be seen protruding from their mouths. Once it becomes fully animated, SCP-1451 displays advanced strength and tactics, being reported to use various martial arts to dispatch targets, pressure point application on humans, and precise strikes on machinery. They move in perfect unison and coordination, with some speculation that they operate on some level of hive mind mentality across the 26 individual entities. Once SCP-1451 has begun its hunt, it will not rest until it has disposed of whatever invaded its territory. The Foundation refers to three states of SCP-1451. Class 1 is the initial ring of statues in its inert state, Class 2 is the slight animation and bubbling seen present, and a Class 3 situation is when an active hunt has begun. To try and prevent a Class 3 situation, the SCP Foundation has installed a sphere of wire mesh netting to ensure nothing too large enters the ring. Natural water currents and oceanic movement aren't to be obstructed. The creature does need to eat sometimes. Number 3, SCP-835. SCP-835 manifests itself as a large cluster of polyps resembling a species of coral, although it's significantly larger than any discovered species of coral. The center mass of the cluster is a very large oval with 3 meter long polyps at each end. SCP-835 does not move, instead anchoring itself to the ocean floor using heaving tentacles that protrude from the polyps. The tentacles are coated in an adhesive substance and have been shown to be incredibly strong, capable of damaging bulkheads and steel. The coral base of SCP-835 is extremely durable and resistant to most attempts to collect any tissue samples, with the Foundation having to use high-powered diamond drill bits to collect even small samples of DNA. SCP-835 emits a large mass of semi-liquid material several times a day from each polyp. The toxic substance appears to be a mixture of digested solids, fecal matters, several bacteria, viruses, and parasites, with many sequences having originated only from 835. So what exactly makes SCP-835 SCP-835 so threatening? Well, sample reports from SCP-835 have shown that it's comprised almost exclusively of human DNA. Its hard shell seems to be recycled tooth enamel, its tentacles matching human flesh. A level 4 clearance declassified document from the Foundation detailed an encounter with an underwater isolation team, in which an incident in which two members of the isolation team were swallowed by SCP-835. Pulled in by its tentacles deep underneath what they had initially thought to be a cave, but realized was the contents of SCP-835's stomach. The crew members reported descending deeper and deeper, spending up to 72 hours inside the creature's digestive tract, the insides of its intestines lined with remnants of unfortunate victims, claiming that they had been morphed into flesh and there was a wall of faces crying for release. Eventually, one of the crew members was released, though after significant breaches to its suit, 
Unfortunately, he had to be let go from the foundation. We thank him for his service. Number two, SCP-1092. SCP-1092 presents itself as a class of Astyachthys fish, and when the creature is matured, it resembles any number of other ocean-dwelling fish, with the only notable variance being its increased aggressive behavior, attacking prey. It's difficult for the foundation to study, as only adult specimens can be studied, as in its juvenile phase, SCP-1092 are parasites birthed from a living host. Once SCP-1092 infects the bloodstream of its host, absorbing nutrients directly from the host's blood. Once exposed, the parasites initially are but a few millimeters in most its size, but grow many times their size, with the largest extracted one on record being 2.1 centimeters. There is insufficient data on how SCP-1092 infects its hosts. The current research data theorizes that minuscule eggs makes its way into the body through small cuts and scrapes, which would explain the fish's violent tendencies. Those infected by SCP-1092 report fatigue, weight loss, and increased appetite, and in many cases report a feeling of something fluttering or squirming inside the body. However, this is not present in all cases, as there are reported case files of hosts not experiencing any visible symptoms whatsoever until the parasite has unfortunately matured to its adult aquatic stage. Once the parasites have matured, the now adolescent creature will try to forcibly remove themselves from the physical body of their host, using their sharp teeth to cut through blood vessels and skin. Subjects at this stage will sustain injuries, severe blood loss, and in some cases worse. Thankfully, the SCP Foundation has effectively secured SCP-1092, keeping it housed in a completely watertight cell, where it is given the occasional domestic pig to act as a host for its reproductive cycle. Poor little piggy. Thank you, piggy. Thank you, Foundation. Number one, SCP-3000. SCP-3000 is one of the most powerful SCPs currently being monitored by the Foundation. SCP-3000 is a Class 8 cognitohazardous entity and is a Level 5 classified document. I really shouldn't even be talking to you about this, but it's good to get this information out there. It is a massive, massive aquatic sea serpent that closely resembles a moray eel, only gigantic. There's been significant difficulty in efforts in trying to document its true size, but it is estimated to be anywhere between between 600 and 900 kilometers in length, with its head measuring roughly 2.5 meters wide and its body as large as 10 meters in diameter. SCP-3000, thankfully, is typically a sedentary creature, not moving much at all, usually only responding to feeding. The majority of its body rarely moves. SCP-3000 has been known to be carnivorous, and when it hunts, it has been known to move exceedingly quickly. Fascinatingly, despite its gargantuan size, SCP-3000 does not appear to need sustenance to maintain its body's function, and thus its digestive process is unknown. Although complicating matters slightly is a process wherein SCP-3000 disperses a thin layer of viscous dark gray sludge through its skin whilst it consumes its prey. It doesn't stop there though. SCP-3000 has been recognized to cause severe mental damage in those who research it. Direct observation and study has been proven to cause mental alteration in Foundation researchers, experiencing paranoia, fear, anxiety, memory loss, and most worryingly, inexplicable severe headaches. It's unknown how SCP-3000 causes this, but the theories are that it has a latent psychic ability. There are some who believe SCP-3000 could be an old god that has found its way into our world. The creature is too immense to be contained in any Foundation facility, instead being kept in a clandestine area of the Bay of Bengal, in an area barred from the public, routinely patrolled and surrounded by Foundation vessels. Be extremely thankful that the brave members of the Foundation are researching and containing this. Secure, contain, protect. Those are the goals of the Foundation. Number five, the Lernean Hydra. I'm no Hercules per se. Yeah, nothing. But thankfully, actually, because those are pretty big shoes to fill. Because that dude had to be brave beyond just like deep breaths and good pep talks. Guy had to literally fight like a 10-story condo building. How does one dude equipped with a club and a sword kill a 10-story building with teeth and three heads? Well, five heads. Well, 10 heads. Depending on how many you cut off, I guess. I guess that's why his name will be remembered and mine will be lost at sea. I guess he was a demigod, half powerful, half regular. A little unfair. By the way, which Hercules did you grow up on? I grew up on the Disney version and Kevin Sorbo. Ugh, oh, what a hunk. But there's been a lot, including the ancient real guy. She's known as simply the Hydra. As a serpentine water monster in Greek and Roman mythology, it's terrifying. Its lair was at the Lake of Lerna, also known to be the entrance of the underworld. Yikes. In the myth, the monster is killed by Heracles, Hercules, as the second of his 12 labors. Okay, so this guy did it and then went on to go and do like 10 more. 10 and 0. Like, how hard can it be, right? 
I mean, it does have multiple heads. Yeah, it does have that. Also, apparently has poisonous breath and blood so violent that uh, its scent is even deadly. Later versions of the Hydra story added regeneration to the monster's abilities too, so it can just start growing heads back at will. For every head chopped off, the Hydra would regrow two heads. So every time the Meg bites a head, there's two more. Another two are growing. Yeah, good thing this thing was hungry and swallows whales whole because uh, that's gonna be a lot of protein. Number four, Jormungandr. Keeping it in the mythology department, we head up a little north. Jormungandr, aka Huge Monster, also known as the Midgard Serpent or the World Serpent. It is a sea serpent and the middle child of Loki and giantess Angraboda. And those middle children, huh? Always the problem, kids. I would know. I am one. According to the prose Edda, Odin took Loki's three children by Angraboda, Fenrir, Hel, and Jormungandr, and tossed Jormungandr into the great ocean. The serpent grew so large that it was able to surround the entire earth and grasp it in its own tail, as it's referred to as, well, the World Serpent. And apparently, when it releases its tail, Ragnarok will begin. Yeah, basically a destruction to the end of the world. Yeah, all this rich history is so heavy and gloomy, isn't it? Isn't there like a, the sun will shine like California for all to enjoy? Like, where's that written down? Nowhere, huh? Just cataclysms and monsters. Jormungandr's arch enemy is the thunder god, Thor. And apparently, a megalodon too. Cause let's face it, a giant serpent versus a four story great white, it would definitely be a good fight. I think if Thor showed up and started smashing up both, it would literally be the best Marvel Universe movie yet. Another encounter comes when Thor goes fishing with the giant Hymir. When Hymir refuses to provide Thor with bait, he strikes the head off Hymir's largest ox to use as his bait. Okay, easy, Roid Rage. Sheesh. They row to a point where Hymir fishes, he prepares his fishing line and a large hook and baits it with the ox head, which Jormungandr bites. Thor then yanks the serpent up from the water and the two throw hands. Okay, so it sounds like it isn't that big. I mean, it's huge, but the wrapping around the planet has got my dimensions off. Maybe it was like a metric versus imperial thing back then. I don't know, what do you think? Comment down below who would win because when it gets into mystical powers and stuff, it becomes a little unfairly matched, no? Number three, Cthulhu. Come on, we know this guy. Now this would be a good fight. This is sort of fathomable. Well, kinda. An extinct shark versus a made up ender of worlds. Cool, let's do that. Basically a giant humanoid octopus dragon versus the Carcharasless Megalodon. A triplex size apex predator. It's definitely gonna be in Vegas and pay per view. I'll tell you that for free. Cthulhu is a fictional cosmic horror entity thought up by the twisted mind of cosmic horror writer H.P. Lovecraft. First introduced in his short story called the Call of Cthulhu, published by the American pulp magazine Weird Tales in 1928. He's like the first creature Lovecraft pondered up. He's terrifying. He's supposed to bring Armageddon upon us when he wakes up from the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, again, not all sunshine and rainbows with these stories. Actually, like, ever with these stories. Cthulhu is a great old one, almost the god of all gods in these stories. All these characters intertwine and apparently he's our last call. Lovecraft depicts it as a gigantic entity worshipped by cultists in the shape of a green octopus, dragon, humanoid, bipedal creature. And it's like 10 stories high. Yeah, like massive. Like us looking at toy army men. The Lovecraft universe, aka the Cthulhu mythos, its appearance alone is enough to haunt your dreams. Lovecraft describes this guy as a face full of octopus-like feelers, a scaly, rubbery looking body, sharp claws on its hands and feet, and of course, dragon's wings. So it can fly and swim. In other words, the worst thing you can imagine. Yeah, Cthulhu can fly, which he has on the Meg for sure. And also the mind control. I don't know how sharks brains works, but Cthulhu gets in there. Yeah, you're in trouble, Sharky. Number two, the Leviathan. Okay, so we're diving into some very sacred texts now, the Bible. In said pieces of scripture, there's a tale of a giant creature that could swallow up cities apparently, and is also an awesome roller coaster at Canada's Wonderland. Gotta try it if you haven't been on it yet. This twisty, turny, vicious monster was actually modeled after this twisty, turny, vicious monster, the Leviathan, the second of the great monsters described in the book of Job. This Leviathan, Leviathan, is an absolute unit of a sea monster who's impervious to literally any human weapon. I mean, what were the weapons back then though? 
like bows and arrows, swords maybe, little pokey things, you know? It's not gonna do much. Apparently locusts too, yeah, those are terrifying. This leviathan breathes fire. It emits smoke from its nostrils, and it's related to another ancient monster called Lotan, a seven-headed giant serpent who's represented as pure chaos. I mean, what Bible creature isn't terrifying though? Was this giant sea snake a water dragon? Because apparently it's something like 300 miles long, according to the Bible. So it's like Jormungandr territory, but longer. Maybe it's the same creature, told by two different peoples? <gasps> Mind blown. Again, the Megalodon, I think, would just chomp this thing and dive deep down to the Twilight Zone and it's lights out. We've seen Jaws, right? Yeah, picture that, but like 40 times the size. Yeah, we're gonna need a bigger boat. Number one, Godzilla. I had to, obviously, we're having fun here today. Godzilla, yes, of course, the King of Kings, AKA Kaiju, originates from a series of Japanese films. The character first appeared in the 1954 film Godzilla and became a worldwide pop culture icon ever since. Appearing in a ton of different media, 32 films, four American films, video games, novels, comic books, TV shows, you name it. Godzilla has been, like I said, the king of king of all monsters. Of course, a phrase first used in Godzilla, king of monsters. Godzilla is enormous. It's destructive. It's a prehistoric sea monster awakened and empowered by nuclear radiation. With the nuclear incidents of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the Lucky Dragon 5 incident, Godzilla doesn't really like nukes. Yeah. The amphibious reptilian monster is basically based around a concept of a dinosaur erect, standing up, very tall. Of course, a bony plated back and tail, and let's not forget the special abilities Godzilla has as well. Atomic heat beams, or as I like to call it, stank breath. Dude had tonsil stones so bad, nuclear energy generates from them. Well, not really, but inside of his body using electromagnetic force to concentrate it into a laser radioactive beam. Amphibious, of course, so it swims and breathes underwater, which is gonna come in handy. Immune to conventional weapons and can regenerate. Yeah, and it's massive. Of course, Godzilla was said to average around 150 feet tall. In the American version, Godzilla is like 400 feet tall. Like, just a little bit bigger. This is kind of a no-brainer here, obviously, right? This little sunfish would have nothing on the king. Number five on this list is the Loch Ness Monster. Nessie, as many people refer to this creature, is said to be a huge, long-necked, almost dinosaur-looking creature that lives in Scotland. This creature of the deep specifically resides in Loch Ness, a 37-kilometer loch located in the Scottish Highlands. The legend of this sea creature went worldwide back in 1933. A photo was released to the public showing a strange creature's head protruding from the water of Loch Ness. The world went into a frenzy after that photo got out and the legend of Nessie began. Ever since that point, many sightings have been reported, other pictures have been taken, and even sonar readings have indicated this creature swimming in the loch. All of that being said though, we've never had indisputable proof that Nessie's real. Well, I'm here to tell you that Nessie is real, but maybe not how you expect. New Zealand scientists have taken samples of the water in Loch Ness and have studied the DNA that they found in it. Professor Neil Gamel, a geneticist, is quoted saying, well, our data doesn't reveal their size, but the sheer quantity of the material that says we can't discount the possibility that there may be giant eels in Loch Ness. Therefore, we can't discount the possibility that what people see and believe is the Loch Ness Monster might be a giant eel. So, the Loch Ness Monster, as we understand it, might not be real, but potentially this loch is full of giant eels that resemble all the features that Nessie's reported as having. Maybe this is why we've had such a hard time proving this myth, because for years, people have been looking for the wrong thing. I really like the legend of the Loch Ness Monster and honestly want it to be true, but if it had to be giant eels, then I think I could accept that as well. Number four on this list is the USS Stein Monster. The USS Stein was a Knox-class destroyer ship in the United States Navy. The ship was eventually decommissioned from the American Navy and was transferred to the Mexican Navy in the 90s. That wasn't before it was attacked by a massive sea monster though. In 1978, the USS Stein was attacked by an unknown entity which we now refer to as the USS Stein Monster. This monster was said to have been a giant, with some people estimating its size up to 150 feet in length. The ship was sailing in the Pacific Ocean when it was attacked. Technical difficulties with the ship started going wrong and eventually they brought it back into the port. Upon inspection, the sonar system was completely damaged. 
There were cuts and gashes over 8% of the ship with some of them being massively deep. They also found suction cups like those of a squid attached to the ship. After investigation of the suction cups and the gashes, it became clear that what they were attacked by isn't your standard animal. Even a giant squid would have had a hard time doing what the monster did to the ship. Ever since that point, the legend of the USS Stein monster has grown. Obviously, this monster has to be real because it has actually attacked a ship. Sadly, we don't know a whole lot about it though. In truth, we know less about what's on the ocean floor than we do about the surface of the moon. So it's very possible that a creature we aren't familiar with yet is dwelling down there. Number three on this list is Megalodon. Would this list really be complete if I didn't include the ancient king of the sea? Eleanor Imster writes, Scientists think that Megalodon looked like a stockier version of the great white shark, with strong, thick teeth built for grabbing prey and breaking bones. Regarded as one of the largest and most powerful predators who have ever lived, fossil remains of Megalodon suggest that this giant shark reached a length of about 60 feet. Their large jaws could exert a bite force up to 24,000 to 41,000 pounds. That is a massive, massive animal, guys. Multiple times bigger than the great white sharks we have today. This thing was so big that it would actually eat entire whales. Now, many myths have surrounded Megalodon and its existence since scientists first brought this mammoth of the sea up. Estimates say that Megalodon went extinct roughly 2.6 million years ago, but some people don't buy into that theory. For quite a while now, the legend of a giant shark still living amongst the ocean has had a lot of people wondering if it's possible. If Megalodon was still alive, is it possible that we still wouldn't know about it? How could we miss a creature this giant? How many of them would there be left in the waters? There are surely a lot of questions that come up if you believe Megalodon is still a reality. If this creature was still alive, then people think the Marianas Trench is where it's located, a place so deep and uncharted that it's hard for us to know for sure what's down there. I'm personally not convinced this creature still roams the ocean, but comment down below your thoughts. Is Megalodon still alive? What do you think? Number two on this list is the Kraken. The Kraken is one of the largest sea monsters that is said to exist. It all started in Nordic folklore many hundreds of years ago when sailors told tale of a massive beast that preys upon the waters of Norway, Greenland, and Iceland. This fearsome beast was said to pull entire ships to their doom and eat every human on board. The first account of the legend was in 1180 by the King of Norway at the time. Since then, sightings of the creature and lore surrounding its capabilities have grown through the years. Fiction writers and movie makers have also latched onto this creature and included it in many stories. As cool as it would be though, to our current knowledge, the Kraken itself isn't real. However, something similar to it definitely is. The Giant Squid. The Giant Squid is a massive squid that's said to be able to grow up to 13 meters in length. Sightings have even put this creature at 20 meters before, but those have never been proven. Even if 13 meters is the maximum length, that's still a large animal and something that would frighten anyone if you're seeing it for the first time. Many experts believe that the legend of the Kraken happened when Norwegian sailors stumbled upon this giant squid, and rather than name it a giant squid, they called it the Kraken. As time went on, the legend spiraled out of control until we got this massive sea monster which attacks boats. Now even though that might be a bit far from the truth, could I believe that there was one giant squid that was potentially bigger than the rest? Absolutely I could. I could also believe that this giant squid might have attacked a ship or two in its time and maybe even brought one down. If it did do all of that, then there really wouldn't be any difference between this squid and the Kraken. Either way, if you see a massive sea creature with tentacles coming after you, I'd just swim in the opposite direction. Number one on this list is the Hook Island Sea Monster. It was first spotted by Robert Le Sarek in 1964 off of Hook Island and after he saw the monster, he went on to describe it in detail. He said, it was only when we got to within 20 feet of the serpent that we could see its head clearly. The head was large, about 4 feet from top to bottom with jaws about 4 feet wide. The lower jaw was flat like that of a sandfish. The skin was smooth but rather dull, brownish black in color. The eyes seemed pale green, almost white. The skin looked more like that of a shark than an eel. There were no apparent scales nor did we see any parasites around. We supposed the flexible tail would have shaken any off. There were no fins or spines, nor were there any apparent breathing openings, although there must have been some. Perhaps we didn't see them because our attention was focused mainly on the creature's menacing mouth, the inside of which was whitish. The teeth appeared to be small. 
A fragment of some dark substance hung from the upper row of teeth, possibly a fish. As the monster was lying on the sandy bottom, we could not see the color of its belly. The creature was about 90 feet long. Behind the head, the body was about 2 feet 4 inches thick and remained that way for about 25 feet. Then it gradually tapered into a whip like tail. The general color of the body was black with one foot wide brownish rings every five feet. The first starting just behind the head. The skin was smooth but dull. So that's his description and after he and his family saw it he took some pictures of the creature to prove his claims. We have to remember that these pictures were taken in 1964 and doctoring them would have been far more difficult back then than it is today. I also tend to believe this claim more than most based on the level of detail he described the beast. Obviously it was pretty jarring experience if he was able to describe the creature in that much detail. Since the claims, people have researched Hook Island for this monster, but with no luck. Hopefully one day we can spot this monster again and know for certain that it truly exists. Number 5. Goblin Shark Under the sea is where nature starts to really let its creative juices flow. It's just an abstract world of tentacles, feelers, and razor sharp teeth down there. Like a Jackson Pollock, but for things that'll bite ya. I know that little crab said it's better down where it's wetter, but I just don't know if I agree if things like the goblin shark are swimming around freely. I know that sounds kind of like I have a strong opinion about these things. And I do. The goblin shark is probably one of the scariest looking living creatures on the planet. The translucent skin really isn't helping matters. I mean, seriously. Google, try and find a cute photo of one of these things, even a little baby. Every single picture of it makes it look like something H.R. Giger would look at and think, hmm, maybe tone it down a bit. The goblin shark gets its name from its grotesque appearance. Sorry to all our goblin shark viewers, it's nothing personal. It's elongated nose and its unique unhinged jaws full of nail-like teeth. That nose isn't just for show either. It actually serves as a little prey detector for the goblin shark. The nose is filled with electroreceptors that allow it to pick up tiny electric fields of prey. It sneaks around the seabed using that little food finder to sniff out its next meal. Electrically charged tracking sharks with monstrous teeth. Wasn't that literally a joke in one of the Austin Powers movies? Goblin sharks actually can't even close their mouths fully with their teeth always being visible just to let you know what they're packing. I think as a general rule of thumb, you should stay away from any creature scientifically named after a goblin. That's advice that has done me well, that's advice that has served Spider-Man well, and I am passing that on to you. Having a good time so far? It would really make my day if you tossed a little old subscribe our way. Number 4. The Pacific Black Dragon Now this is an entry I could probably include solely on a name basis. You wouldn't even need to see a picture of it, and you just trust that the Pacific Black Dragon is a scary looking fish. However. I'm a visual learner and you're watching a YouTube video, so we're going to include several pictures of one of Mother Nature's most precious little abhorrent monstrosities. Take a look at this thing. You would be forgiven for thinking that this thing popped out of that one guy's chest an alien because it looks way more like a chest burster than it does a fish. And for those keeping track at home, that's my second reference to the 1979 sci-fi classic and it probably won't be the last in this video. This angry little noodle, occasionally referred to as the Black Sea Dragon, gets its name from the fact that its skin absorbs 99.95% of the light in its habitat, which happens to be anywhere from 1600,000 feet to 6,000 feet below the depths. Meaning this thing is dark. It hides in plain sight in the pitch black water, letting the bait hanging from its chin attract prey. Smaller fish swim up to what they think is something appetizing. And then the last thing they ever see is two beady little glowing eyes and then nothing. While this little fish is one of the smallest monsters on our list, I don't trust a fish that learned how to fish. There's something traitorous about that behavior. And honestly, maybe it's shallow, but I just can't move on from how truly horrifying this thing looks. I'm vapid, I can admit that. And I would love to see the Megalodon snarf this thing up. Number 3. Japanese Spider Crab how do spiders manage to get into everything? Doesn't matter where you are, you will find a spider crawling around in your apartment, up your shower, on your walls, on the toilet seat. I thought we would have been safe at least in the ocean, but I really should have known better. Introducing the Japanese spider crab, a creature pulled directly from my nightmares in my therapy sessions. These things look like they crawled out of the dankest depths and can grow up to 12 feet long. 
They can grow up to be 40 pounds, and if somehow one of its many legs gets severed, they can just regrow those no problem when they molt next. They're not just one of the longest crabs in the world, they also have possibly the longest lifespan of any crab, with a spider crab living to up to 100 years old. You're telling me there's a crabby long legs walking around out there who was born in the 20s, still kicking about on the ocean floor, moving his little bowler hat, spinning his little crabby cane? Now a little bit of cursory digging taught me two things about the spider crab to put my fears on ice. Apparently these monsters, despite their outward appearance, are completely benevolent and are more content to scavenge around the ocean floor looking for scraps than they are ever likely to interact with a human and are actually considered to be quite lazy by crab standards. Apparently they taste amazing and are considered a delicacy in some parts of Japan. I know for me, a key part of exposure therapy and getting over any of my fears is to eat my fears slathered in a buttery reduction, uh, prepared over rice, maybe with a nice soy sauce. I'm looking at more pictures and maybe I was totally wrong about the Japanese spider crab. I'm also very tall in a way that concerns people and I'm very lazy, usually scavenging for my next meal as well. Although I am hoping that my next meal is a spider crab sushi combo. Number two, stargazer. The stargazer is a fish that's got a face only a mother nature could love. And even then, it looks like she might not be that generous. This thing kind of looks like if you buried a pug up to its face and then left it out in the sun for a few months. I don't think it's even too much of a stretch to say this might very well be the ugliest fish on the planet. Now, it's not a crime to be the ugliest fish on the planet, and you certainly wouldn't make a list of terrifying creatures just for being a little bit ugly. The stargazer earned its place on this list for also being one of the meanest fishes out there. Oh, it's always the ones you least expect. The stargazer has defensive capabilities that make it sound a lot more like it's a Pokemon than a fish. These things will bury themselves in the ocean floor, turning themselves into a little trap and then using their massive mouths as a vacuum and sucking their unsuspecting prey right up. And if that wasn't enough of an evolutionary selling point for you, the stargazer also has electric organs at the top of it which transmit electric shocks to predators. That's a nasty little guy. Now the name stargazer comes from the fact that when it's burrowing, it buries itself down and the only thing peering out is its ugly little eyes peering upwards at the sky or the stars. I gotta say, I got absolutely no love for these things. I like that they're very ugly, that's charming, but the rest of it, no. They're like scaly little zappy landmines. Number one, Portuguese man o' war. Of all the things on this list, the Portuguese man o' war seems like it's the most not from this planet. It looks beautifully ethereal, like something you'd see floating around in the background in a Star Wars planet or maybe hanging out with the blue things from Avatar. It's a truly cosmic looking wonder of nature. However, it is anything but. The first clue should be the fact that it is named after a 17th century battleship. It looks a bit like a jellyfish, but in actuality, it's a strange little colonial organism made up of smaller organisms called zooids. See, th this already sounds like I'm talking about an alien, a zooid. You gonna look me in the eyes and tell me a zooid is real? This thing actually isn't even an animal per se, but three organisms in a trench coat trying to sneak into the movies. The main zooid is a gas-filled translucent sac, which coincidentally is uh, what my 10th grade gym teacher used to call me to motivate me to run around the track faster. The gas-filled sac allows the colony to float. The man of war has no means of movement, instead having to rely on the currents of the ocean to direct it around. Real go with the flow type of organism. Not a bad attitude, to be honest. Now the next zooid, oh, <laughs> I am never gonna get used to saying that are the tentacles, which are really the star of the show here. The tentacles on a man of war reach lengths of up to 165 feet. Now I'll run that by you in case you heard that, fainted, and didn't quite catch what I said. Get up off the floor. Their tentacles can get up to 165 feet long. <laughs> That's really long. The tentacles, which mind you, carry a sting like a jellyfish's. It's been known to cause paralysis, is enough to kill a fish, and has been on some occasions enough to be lethal to humans. One Redditor recounts a painful story of a vacation to Cuba, strolling a beach and seeing what they thought was a plastic bag floating in the water. They then went to pick it up and as they described, the next thing I knew, I woke up in the hospital in a vinegar bath with a morphine drip, a team of doctors extracting the tentacles that were stuck into my hand. That's enough to keep me away from the water for a bit and maybe uh, prevent myself from ever doing a good deed, try to pick up some litter. 
I feel like even the Megalodon might want to be careful around this strange monster. The Colossal Squid is a creature that is not to be confused with the Giant Squid, which is similar, but slightly smaller. These guys live in the darkest, coldest depths surrounding the waters of Antarctica. This creature lives up to its name as it reaches an average of 46 feet in size, and it weighs around 500 kilograms, with the females being the largest of the species. They also have large tentacles equipped with suckers that have little razor hooks on them to better latch onto its prey, so uh, let's hope it's not you. Its diet mainly consists of large fish, such as the 7 foot Patagonian toothfish, and small ones, and some even consume their own kind. But they've also been known to try and consume even larger prey, like sperm whales, who often have been seen with scars attributing to the battles they must have faced. They're colossal, they're scary, and they're ambitious. What more could you want from a sea monster? Only two specimens have ever been collected, with the second being found recently in 2014, so on top of how frightening they are, they're also extremely elusive. In our number 9 spot today, we have the scalloped hammerhead shark. These sharks, of course, belong to the hammerhead family, and the main feature is their oddly shaped heads. These guys are a coastal pelagic species, and their eyes and nostrils can be found at the ends of the tips of their head extensions. These sharks like to use the shore as a breeding ground, and their young have an incredibly high metabolic rate, which means that they need a ton of food or else they will starve. These guys are quite notable for their large and complex brains. They have quite high levels of cognitive capabilities, and they're often really socially intelligent. They have complex migratory patterns and habitat relationships, and they are very athletic and clever when it comes to capturing prey. Nothing better than a super smart, extremely hungry shark. Their brains are great for the species in a multitude of ways, of course, but especially in terms of reproduction. Because of their social intelligence, it helps them to seek out the fittest members of the species to procreate with. Unfortunately, as of this year, however, the scalloped hammerhead shark is now listed as critically endangered, with the main cause for the population decline being overfishing. They are over harvested because of their large size, as well as the fact that apparently their fins have a high fin needle content, and so they are sold for $100 to $120 US per kilogram. In our number 8 spot today, we have tiger sharks. Tiger sharks are a species of shark that are the only surviving member of their genus. These macro predators can grow to be quite large, reaching lengths of over 5 meters or 16 feet and 5 inches. They're usually found in tropical and temperate waters, and their tiger name comes from the dark stripes that can distinctly be seen running down its body, although these marks do fade as the sharks mature. Tiger sharks live mostly solitary lives, and they are nocturnal hunters. They are well known for having quite the variety of prey, which includes crustaceans, fish, seals, birds, squid, turtles, sea snakes, dolphins, and even other smaller sharks. Unfortunately, these sharks are nearing a point of being a threatened species due to finning and fishing by humans, but it is thought that the Bermuda Triangle might be home to a secret sort of breeding ground for these guys. Hopefully. If this is the case, we can find a way to help protect the area so that the species can once again thrive. After the great white shark, tiger sharks are the second in line when it comes to the most recorded fatal attacks on humans, but although that sounds terrifying, these events are extremely rare. I learned that from the documentary that I watched. In our number 7 spot today, we have the deep sea lizard fish. Deep sea lizard fish are a small family of deep water fish who are related to the telescope fish. These guys have flat heads and curved, barbed teeth, and they grow up to 78 centimeters or 31 inches in length, which makes them a pretty moderately sized fish. They prefer to stay at depths of 1,600 meters or 5,200 feet, and they're actually one of the world's deepest living apex predators. These lizard fish are known to eat anything that comes their way, including other fish of their own kind. Despite the lack of light in the depths of the ocean, these guys have really large eyes and pupils, and their vision is actually really important for their prey detection, as their well developed eyes allow them to see any residual or bioluminescent light. Not a lot is known about their reproduction habits, but one thing that is known is that deep sea lizard fish have both male and female reproductive organs, which is thought to be an adaptation to low population density. In our number 6 spot today, we have the flying spaghetti monster. I know, it sounds a little silly, but I swear this creature really does exist. This deep sea creature is a species of siphonophore that can usually be found in the Atlantic Ocean. While these guys appear to be one organism, they are actually a colonial organism, which means that they are composed of many, many medusoid and polypoid zooids. Zooids are multicellular units that develop from one single fertilized egg, and they combine to create
create functional colonies like the flying spaghetti monster. In our number 5 spot today, we have the faceless cusk eel. Anything that's called faceless certainly can't be good, and this eel is absolutely no exception. These guys don't have a face, and they honestly look like the dementors of the deep sea. The first time one of these was found was in 1973 when oceanographers aboard the HMS Challenger discovered it, but for a century, no one else came across one of these guys. Perhaps it's because they like to make their home in the icy waters located 13,000 feet below the surface of the ocean. Just a few years ago, when these guys were sort of rediscovered, one of the leaders of the expedition, Tim O'Hara, told The Guardian that, quote, it looks like two rear ends on a fish. Really. Apparently, the mouth of these guys sits underneath its body and can extend out to catch food before disappearing back inside its own body. It's kind of cool, kind of gross. In our number four spot today, we have the fang tooth fish. The fang tooth fish has a mouth full of razor sharp teeth, perfect for clutching just about any size of prey in its jaw. That's right, any size. They live in the deepest parts of the ocean, the deepest having been recorded around 16,000 feet. That is until they just so happen to feel like migrating up to the surface for a little vacation. Unlike a lot of other deep sea dwellers, fang tooths do not have any bioluminescent organs to attract their prey. That is because they are not the like sit and wait kind of predator, and instead they seek out their lunch using their excellent sense of smell. They are more active than most deep sea dwellers and heavily rely on any light that may sink into their dark home. In our number three spot today, we have the Pacific viper fish. The Pacific viper fish can be found at different areas in the ocean, depending on the time of day. They usually usually like to stay in the baffle zone, which is about 100 meters to 400 meters below the surface of the ocean, but during the nighttime, they will sometimes rise up into much shallower water because there is more food for them to eat. It's easy to pick out which fish is a viper fish because of the fact that its jaw is sticking out forward and then they have those extra long pointy teeth. The Pacific viper fish is predatory and mostly eats other fish, but it will also chow down on crustaceans, plankton, and shrimp. This fish can grow to be about one foot long and they are considered one of the most aggressive fish for their size. I know it's only one foot long, but hearing how vicious it is, coupled with how ugly it is, and I really don't want to be anywhere near this thing. One cool thing about these fish though is that they have what is called ultra black skin, and it reduces the reflection of anything that is illuminated around them so that they can camouflage themselves easier in the darkness of the deep sea. In our number two spot today, we have the sea spider. Okay, if you're like me and don't like the spiders that exist on land, unfortunately this one is not going to be up your alley. Sea spiders are giant, and they like to suck the life out of their prey. Yeah, how terrifying and honestly gross. They basically just latch onto their prey for dear life and suck out all of the fluid that they possibly can. They are gross, but they technically aren't actually spiders. These guys have a leg span that is comparable to some of the largest land spiders, but the thing with these guys is that they carry their organs in their legs, because I mean they're basically all legs. The good news is, is that they prefer the really cold temperatures like the ones in the waters surrounding surrounding Antarctica, so unless you're planning on taking an icy cold plunge anytime soon, you're unlikely to encounter one of these creepy crawly sea creatures. In our number one spot today, we have the Megamouth Shark. These guys are a species of deep water shark that is rarely ever seen by humans, so there is so much about them that remains a total mystery. Since its discovery, which first came in 1976, there have been fewer than 100 specimens ever observed or caught. These guys are planktivorous, which means that they like to feed on planktonic foods. This leads to them swimming with their mouths wide open, and this, coupled with their extremely large heads and lips, makes them easily recognizable if you were to ever run into one on a casual trip to the deep sea. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the demon. There are many stories and alleged sightings of what is now referred to as the Black Demon of Cortez, which is said to be a massive black shark seen off of Mexico's Baja coast. One story in particular regarding this elusive shark comes from a fisherman named Eric Mack. He had reported that one day while sailing, he felt his boat begin to rock, which immediately gave him the feeling something was awry. Eric was even further startled when he explained that he saw a massive towering tail sticking at least five feet out of the water. The stories of this shark are so infamous that it was even the focus of an episode of a History Channel show called Monster Quest. Maybe if there's a part two of this video, we'll talk about some more of the sightings around the demon. In our number nine spot today, we have the prehistoric monster. Back in 1959, a fisherman named Tex Geds and his friend James Gavin were boating somewhere just off of the coast of Scotland. It is said that during their 
time out to sea, they encountered a sea monster that neither of them had ever seen before. They described its head as being sort of turtle shaped and that it was a quote hellish monster of prehistoric times and said that it was breathing heavily through a quote large red gash of a mouth. Okay, not exactly a kind description, but definitely a bit of a terrifying one. I think it's important to bring up that we actually don't really know what megalodons look like. We have a sort of idea, but at the end of the day, we only have what, some fossils, jaws, spines, teeth. It doesn't really leave us that much to work with. While it isn't quite clear what these two men saw for sure, and it's likely that we'll never know, whatever it was definitely wasn't just the average sea creature. In our number eight spot today, we have the TikTok shark. In May of last year, someone on on TikTok called Alex Albrecht, who is a marine biodiversity student as well as a musician, shared a video on the app that had people seriously shocked. The TikTok shows a massive shark lurking around the ship that Alex was on, which is said to have been just off of the coast of Massachusetts at the time. The ship was full of research students when this massive shark made its appearance, many of which either screamed or had some sort of expletive in response. Another TikTok user asked in the comments if the shark in the video is a megalodon, considering how absolutely huge the thing was. Was this an actual megalodon? Likely not, but hey, I'm not the marine biodiversity student here, so who am I to say? In our number seven spot today, we have snorkeling. Robert Pamperin and a friend, Gerald Lair, were snorkeling off of La Jolla Cove in California in 1959 when Robert was attacked by a shark. It is said to have all happened quite quickly and Gerald was alerted to the distress when he heard Robert scream. Gerald turned and saw Robert unusually high in the water and his mask was missing. At this point, Gerald dove under and this is when he realized exactly what was going on. There was a shark that had Robert in its mouth up to his waist. Unfortunately, there really wasn't much that Gerald could do to stand up to this absolutely massive shark that he described as larger than your average great white. Robert sadly did not survive the event, and by the time rescuers arrived, they were only able to locate one of his fins. In our number six spot today, we have the photographer. This is an encounter that occurred just last year in November, basically a year ago. Underwater photographer Darren Verbeck was diving off of the coast of Hawaii's Big Island when he saw what he thought was a school of fish. He began to get closer, I mean the whole photographer thing, and as he got closer he started to think that what he was actually seeing was a tiger shark. He got even closer and that's when he said, quote, I kept looking at the head. I'm like, that is not a tiger shark. And it got closer and closer and it just kept getting bigger and bigger. Darren continued to get closer to the shark and estimated it to be over 15 feet, which is definitely quite large. He explained that the shark was not acting in a threatening way, so he continued to take his photos and shot as much as he could before the massive shark decided to swim away. Experts explained that the shark was likely in the area because of humpback whales, and honestly, I don't want to see the shark that could take down one of those beasts. In our number five spot today, we have Deep Blue. This shark is, in fact, not a megalodon. I'll just be honest about that, but it definitely is a more modern contender. Deep Blue is the name of a great white shark who is most definitely one of the largest ever recorded, at least in our lifetime. This colossal monster is the largest great white shark ever caught on camera by scientists. She is measured to be 20 feet long, 8 feet high, and about 2.5 tons. And while this isn't all that huge compared to her massive prehistoric cousin, it certainly is no small feat. Rumors of her existence have been spread since as far back as the 1990s, but it wasn't until 2014 that she was officially caught on camera and documented. Researchers at the time were in the midst of studying tiger sharks, but she made her grand appearance after scavenging some food from a sperm whale carcass nearby. In our number 4 spot today, we have the USS Indianapolis. This is a story that has been considered the worst shark attack in history, which is definitely a horrific thing to think about. In 1945, the USS Indianapolis was an unescorted US warship that was sailing in the Pacific when it was struck by a Japanese torpedo. This had no problem tearing the ship in two, which then meant that 900 sailors were now floating in the ocean waiting for rescue. Over the next five days, nearly 600 men lost their lives due to shark attacks. That's either a group of sharks or a few very large, very hungry ones. From the survivors' accounts of what happened over the course of those days, it seemed like an absolutely nightmare situation. This is exactly why it has gone on to be called one of the worst shark attacks in history. In our number three spot today, we have Rodney Fox. Rodney Fox is a man who is thought of as one of the best spear fishermen in the world. In 1963, he was partaking in the Australian Spear Fishing Championships, which were being held just south of Adelaide, when he went through what is widely regarded as, again, one of the worst shark 
shark attacks in history. The shark he encountered bit him around the waist, which ended up puncturing his diaphragm, ripping his lungs, and crushing his rib cage. Not only this, but the attack left his organs exposed, so much so that when he finally made it back to shore, those rescuing him had to keep his wetsuit on to ensure that his insides actually stayed on the inside. Despite the fact that Rodney needed at least four hours of surgery and about 400 stitches, like many people who have had these sort of terrifying encounters, rather than shying away from sharks in the water, he leaned in. He actually became an advocate for sharks after this. He created the first underwater shark observatory and helped to dispel the rumors that sharks are bad, crazy, scary animals that we should all fear. In our number two spot today, we have the Jersey Shore. Back in 1916, during the summer season, there were five different shark attacks that occurred over the span of 10 days that ended up in the deaths of four people. This wasn't something that had been seen before in the area, which of course left people speculating as to why this was happening. There was a heat wave in the area during the time, which likely led to more people being out, enjoying summertime sort of activities, and maybe this attracted the shark, but in the end, no one knows for sure because no one even knows what kind of shark is responsible for the attacks in the first place. Luckily, this didn't go on to become a continuous trend and whatever shark this was, it went on its merry way or perhaps found another source of food, but this series of attacks definitely kept the public on edge for the weeks and months surrounding. In our number one spot today, we have Watson and the shark. For this one, we are headed all the way back to 1749 with a cabin boy named Brooke Watson. Brooke was swimming in the Havana Harbor when he had his encounter with a shark. This one grabbed him by his right foot and dragged him underwater. The shark got a second chomp on his foot before a rescue boat was able to come and save him. The sailor on the boat managed to get the shark to back off enough that they could get Brooke out of the water. Brooke lost his lower leg, but his life was saved, which is absolutely the most important part. Brooke's story is not over, however, as he went on to become a member of parliament and eventually Lord Mayor of England. He was so proud of himself for not only surviving a shark attack, but then going on to earn this title that he commissioned famous artists. Artist John Singleton Copley to create a painting called Watson and the Shark, which detailed his terrifying encounter and probably went on to scare a ton of people at the time. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the Zuyo Maru monster. This story is one that comes to us from 1977, and rather than an alive animal sighting, this one is actually this carcass that was found that we still aren't quite sure what it belongs to. The Zoyu Maru carcass was one that was found by Japanese fishermen near New Zealand. Because it was so unique, it was taken to be analyzed, and while many have speculated that it was a basking shark, that has never been confirmed or proven. Considering the fact that it was definitely shark-like, but just not quite clear as to what exactly it was, is definitely interesting. In our number 9 spot today, we have the sea creature. Back in both 1817 as well as 1819, there was a sea creature that visited the coast of Massachusetts and it was seen by hundreds of people, but no one has been able to identify what it could have been for sure. The creature was said to be around 3 feet in diameter and around 50 feet long, and it is said that it moved similarly to how a whale or a dolphin might. The first sighting of this creature was when some fishermen spotted it, but the real panic began as the creature started to show itself closer to shore. To this day, some people swear that this was some sort of real sea monster, and others believe it was just a case of mass hysteria. What do you think? In our number 8 spot today, we have the prehistoric monster. Back in 1959, a fisherman named Tex Geds and his friend, James Gavin, were boating somewhere just off of the coast of Scotland. It is said that during their time out to sea, they encountered a sea monster that neither of them had seen before. They described its head as being sort of turtle-shaped, and that it was a, quote, hellish monster of prehistoric times, and said that it was breathing heavily through a, quote, large red gash of a mouth. Okay, not exactly a kind description, but definitely Definitely a bit of a terrifying one. I think it's important to bring up that we don't actually know what megalodons looked like. We have a sort of idea, but at the end of the day, we only have fossils, jaws, and spines, and that doesn't leave us that much to work with. While it isn't quite clear what these two men saw for sure, and it's likely that we'll never know, whatever it was definitely wasn't just your average sea creature. In our number seven spot today, we have Dr. Gru. When we think of the tales of sea monsters and myths, we often think of the many serpent like creatures that just may be lurking underneath the water. This is definitely a common theme, and in the 17th century, there was a botanist who came up with a sort of explanation for these sea serpent sightings. It's important to note that this botanist was a very legitimate scientist who really worked to change basically everything we knew about plant anatomy, so when he came forth with this evidence and explanation, it rightfully caught people's attention. Basically, he had this specimen, which was a sample of skin that he said was from some sort of seal, but that it had a neck just as long as the 
rest of its body. Of course, this would explain a whole bunch of sea monster sightings, but in the end, the skin sample ended up completely disappearing, making any confirmation of the story or the animal's existence completely impossible. I know a megalodon isn't necessarily supposed to look like a seal with a long neck, but who's to say for sure that it doesn't? In our number six spot today, we have the shipwreck. Back in 1909, the French steamer La Seine was out to sea when it collided with the British India steamer, the Onda. A shipwreck is never good, but this one was particularly bad as, in heavy fog, the French ship sank in just two minutes. This of course left people stranded in the water and, I mean, you can probably see where this is going. In the aftermath of this wreck while waiting for the rescue, there were 101 people who lost their lives from shark attacks. That's a lot of people. That is either a lot of sharks or a very few large ones. I mean, none of us were there, so it's hard to say for sure, but whatever really happened here, it's an absolutely horrifying tragedy. In our number five spot today, we have the kayak encounter. Ida Parker and Kristen Orr were kayaking off of the coast of Plymouth in 2014 when they encountered a shark. This is truly a nightmare scenario, and it must have been absolutely terrifying. The pair, however, had actually set off with the intention of seeing a great white shark, and while it's likely that this is exactly what they encountered, they definitely did not expect what happened next. The two had heard of rumblings of a shark in the area that had swallowed a seal in one gulp, and this is what sparked their desire to head out on this journey. While out there, however, the shark began to attack their kayaks. In the end, both of them made it out alive, and when their kayaks were recovered, one was found with a huge bite mark in it. In our number four spot today, we have the oldest shark attack. Considering the fact that the megalodon is said to have been extinct somewhere over two million years ago, even evidence that seems ancient to us is a lot more recent than what our current understanding of their timeline here on Earth would suggest. That is exactly why the discovery of what is speculated to be the world's oldest evidence of a shark attack is very interesting. This discovery came by way of a 3,000 year old human skeleton that is marked with different gashes and puncture wounds. It is said that because of the volume of wounds, it makes it slightly easier to tell the story of what happened. This is because while researchers first believed that perhaps the wounds were caused by metal weapons, this could not explain why there were so many in certain parts of the body. Another telltale sign is how this skeleton was discovered in Japan, which at the time of this person's life, there weren't really any metal weapons at that point in history in Japan, which ruled out this theory entirely. They were also able to rule out other terrestrial carnivores, and that's when they turned to marine life to look for some more answers. Because of the time it's been, we obviously don't know what creature was involved in this attack for sure, but with the mass amount of wounds found on the skeleton, it was likely to be something large and terrifying. In our number three spot today, we have snorkeling. Robert Pamperin and a friend, Gerald Lair, were snorkeling off of La Jolla Cave in California in 1959 when Robert was attacked by a shark. It is said to have all happened quite quickly, and Gerald was alerted to the distress when he heard Robert scream. Gerald turned and saw Robert unusually high in the water, and his mask was missing. At this point, Gerald dove under, and this is when he realized exactly what was going on. There was a shark that had Robert in its mouth up to his waist. Unfortunately, there was not much Gerald could do to stand up to this absolutely massive shark that he described as larger than your average great white. Robert sadly did not survive the event, and by the time rescuers arrived, they were only able to locate one of his fins. In our number two spot today, we have the Jersey Shore. Back in 1916, during the summer season, there were five different shark attacks that occurred over the span of 10 days that ended up in the deaths of four people. This wasn't something that had been seen before in the area, which of course left people speculating as to why. There was a heat wave in the area during the time which likely led to more people being out, enjoying summertime sort of activities, and maybe this attracted the shark, but in the end, no one knows for sure, because no one even knows what kind of shark is responsible for the attacks in the first place. Luckily, this didn't go on to become a continuous trend, and whatever shark this was went on its merry way, or perhaps found another food source, or whatever, but this series of attacks definitely kept the public on edge for the weeks and months surrounding. In our number one spot today, we have the USS Indianapolis. This is a story that has been considered the worst shark attack in history, which is definitely a horrific thing to think about. In 1945, the USS Indianapolis was an unescorted US warship that was sailing in the Pacific when it was struck by a Japanese torpedo. This had no problem tearing the ship in two, which meant that 900 sailors were now floating in the ocean, waiting for rescue. 
rescue. Over the next five days, nearly 600 men lost their lives due to shark attacks. I said this about the other one that was similar to this, and I'll say it again. That's either a group of sharks or a very few large, very hungry ones. From the survivors' accounts of what happened over the course of those days, it seemed like an absolutely nightmare situation. This is exactly why this has gone on to be called one of the worst shark attacks in history. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the TikTok shark. In May of last year, someone on TikTok called Alex Albrecht, who is a marine biodiversity student as well as a musician, shared a video on the app that had people seriously shocked. The TikTok shows a massive shark lurking around the ship that Alex was on, which is said to have just been off of the coast of Massachusetts at the time. The ship was full of research students when this massive shark made its appearance, many of which either screamed or had some sort of expletive to say in response. Another TikTok user asked in the comments if the shark in the video is a megalodon, considering how absolutely huge this thing was. Was this an actual megalodon? Likely not, but hey, I'm not the marine life student here, so who am I to say? In our number nine spot today, we have the cray fisherman. David Stead is an Australian naturalist, and in his book titled Sharks and Rays of the Australian Seas, he details an encounter with a shark that some have taken to believe is the legendary Megalodon herself. Apparently, this incident happened in 1981 to a group of cray fishermen that David spoke with. These fishermen were absolutely terrified of a shark they saw in their fishing grounds, which were just off of Broughton Island. They were so scared, in fact, that they refused to return to the fishing spot for days. All the men agreed that the shark was monstrous and that it was most definitely a shark, not a whale. The men explained that they had never seen a shark of that size before, and considering how they were all seasoned fishermen who had all had their fair share of encounters with sharks, whales, and all of the terrifying things that the ocean has to offer, how frightened they were really did leave quite the impression. In our number 8 spot today, we have two specimens. This story comes from all the way back in 1869, when an Irish scientist headed out on an expedition to Seychelles. It is said that he went there to study fish, but man, he was not prepared for the specimens he would go on to study. It is said that he found one that was over 15 meters, which is already a whopping almost 50 feet, but the other one really took the cake. The second specimen it is said that he found was alleged to have been 23 meters long, which is a massive 75 feet. Since this was so long ago, there wasn't any official documentation of it, but if there had been, the second one would hold the record for being the largest ever recorded. That is absolutely wild. Seeing it is one thing, but imagine being able to actually study it. In our number 7 spot today, we have the sailors. This gigantic shark sighting is said to have taken place in the 1960s, just off of the edge of Australia's Great Barrier Reef. According to author B.C. Cartmel in his book Let's Go Fossil Shark Tooth Hunting, the sailors and involved in this sighting initially refused to talk about it because of the fear of being teased for being afraid of what they had seen. After some time, however, they began to speak about the incident. They explained that while on board their 85-foot ship, they needed to weigh anchor in order to conduct some engine repairs. While this was ongoing, the crew became absolutely shocked when they saw the biggest shark they had ever seen slowly swimming past their completely stuck ship. Just like the last one, all the men agreed that they were not mistaking a whale and that it was indeed a shark. They also said that this shark was so large it was rivaling the boat in size. That is absolutely massive. Whether it really was a megalodon or not, whatever shark they saw that day certainly wasn't the average size. In our number 6 spot today, we have the battle scar. This story is a little different than the others on today's list, and it started with the sighting of a great white shark. This 15 foot long shark was spotted swimming just off of Isla Guadalupe in Mexico, but what was so striking about this great white in particular was the absolutely savage wound it had on its side. This huge bite mark had people speculating as to what in the world could have caused it. I mean, there aren't very many predators to great whites, so it's a pretty rare occasion to see such a huge bite mark right on the side of one, and people were doubting whether or not another shark would have done this to one of its own species. There definitely are reasons for why this could have been an attack from another shark, but of course people took this as a possible sign that maybe there's something bigger lurking in the waters. If the megalodon somehow isn't actually extinct and just 
Greece manages to evade any sort of confirmation of its existence, it certainly would need a ton of food to survive, which makes big fish like great whites a perfect snack. The megalodon is, however, one of the most powerful predators to have ever lived on our planet, so if this bite really was from a megalodon, it's surprising that this great white made it out alive. In our number 5 spot today, we have a world record. Basking sharks are known for being one of the largest fish in the ocean, and that is exactly why the largest one ever recorded was definitely something to write home about. In 1851, in the Bay of Fundy, which sits between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia here in Canada, a basking shark was caught in a herring net. This shark was measured to be at least 40 feet long, which is astoundingly large, and it certainly confused those who had caught it at first. I can imagine that they likely also thought that they had some kind of living fossil caught up in their net, but nope, instead they just set a new world record. In our number 4 spot today, we have the demon. There are many stories and alleged sightings of what is now referred to as the quote, Black Demon of Cortez, which is said to be a massive black shark seen off of Mexico's Baja coast. One story in particular regarding this elusive shark comes from a fisherman named Eric Mack. He had reported that one day while sailing, he felt his boat begin to rock, which immediately gave him the feeling that something was awry. Eric was even further startled when he explained that he saw a massive towering tail sticking at least five feet out of the water. The stories of this shark are so infamous that it was even the focus of an episode of a History Channel show called Monster Quest. Maybe if there's a part two of this video, we'll talk about some more of the sightings surrounding the demon. In our number three spot today, we have Deep Blue. This shark is in fact not a megalodon, but it definitely is a more modern contender. Deep Blue is the name of a great white shark who is most definitely one of the greatest ever recorded, at least in our lifetime. This colossal monster is the largest great white shark ever caught on camera by scientists. She is measured to be 20 feet long, 8 feet high, and about 2.5 tons. And while this isn't all that huge compared to her massive prehistoric cousin, it certainly is no small feat. Rumors of her existence have been spread since as far back as the 1990s, but it wasn't until 2014 that she was officially caught on camera and documented. Researchers at the time were in the midst of studying tiger sharks, but she made her grand appearance after scavenging some food from a sperm whale carcass nearby. In our number two spot today, we have Bigger Than the Boat. Zane Grey is a man who is a novelist, and he is definitely best known for his adventure novels, but it is also said that he was a deep sea angler, and it was during one of his fishing adventures that his Megalodon sighting came. In the novel, which is titled Megalodon, Fact or Fiction, writer Rick Emmer speaks of this incident, saying that Zane claimed to have seen, quote, one of the man-eating monsters of the South Pacific. It is said that whatever kind of shark he saw, it was a shark that was much longer than his boat, which was somewhere from 30 to 40 feet. He also said that this shark was yellow and green, and that it had a few white spots. Most notably, however, he said that the shark had a massive square head, and that it had, quote, immense pectoral fins. This is all to say that whether he saw a megalodon or not, whatever he saw was not just a harmless great white shark. What do you guys think? Perhaps a megalodon sighting, or just one of the tall, exciting tales told by Mr. Gray. In our number one spot today, we have the Mariana Trench sighting. A few years ago, a video began circulating the internet, and it shows a gigantic shark scouring the seafloor. People online quickly put a story to the video, saying that allegedly this is a megalodon that was caught on camera at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. The creature is seen swimming over top of what is apparently an abandoned shark cage, and the video seems to be enough to have convinced convinced many, many people. The video certainly is compelling, and whatever we see is most definitely terrifying to look at, but with my very limited knowledge of anything that lives in the sea, it's tough to say anything further. While some people swear that this is solid proof, others have brought up sharks that may have a similar appearance to the one seen in the video. 